Hello, welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. I'm Steve Lagerfeld, your host for today's program. My guest today is Professor David Levering Lewis of New York University, who is the author of God's Crucible, Islam and the Making of Europe, 570 to 1215. It's an extraordinarily timely book that gives real insight into the continuing encounter between Islam and the West. Among his other books is a biography of the African-American thinker and activist W.E.B. Du Bois in two volumes, both of which won Pulitzer Prizes. Part of his work on those books was done while he was a fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Professor Lewis, welcome back. Um, that's quite a jump from Du Bois and all your other work in American history to Europe and Islam uh, uh, a millennium and more ago. <clears throat> what, uh, uh, what possessed me to what do What possessed that? you to make such a big change? The question is, is put to me, uh, of course, uh, inescapably and, and appropriately, uh, but I, I would in my defense say that though this does represent uh, an act of interloping historically, uh, I wrote a book a few years ago at the end of the 70s uh, based on <clears throat> research that I uh, committed uh, in uh, the Sudan, in Khartoum, uh, when I wrote a book about uh, uh, imperialism in the Horn of Africa mm -hmm. and their uh, Muslim fundamentalism of the 19th century interrupted the progress of the British Empire as it moved up the Nile for a, a decade. Uh, I left uh, uh, the Sudan in 1982 or 3, uh, and shortly thereafter the secular regime was overthrown and Sharia was imposed and a fundamentalist uh, uh, regime uh, with the cast of characters descended indeed from the Mahdi and the Khalifa of the 19th century ran the show. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that what had happened to the British Empire at the turn of the uh, 19th century uh, might uh, be in the cards for the uh, empire of the 20th century, the United States, and that uh, the various uh, uh, interactions uh, in East Africa with embassies uh, being uh, uh, attacked and uh, the American cruiser off the coast of Yemen uh, and indeed the, the, the prolegomena to 9-11 uh, and 1991, the attack on the uh, two uh, towers in New York, that all of that foretold perhaps something quite similar. And so uh, I, uh, I, I got my uh, publisher to uh, uh, accept a contract to write just a short book, a kind of large essay, Best meditation. Laid plans. That's right. <laughs> Here we are. It's uh, <clears throat> Our viewers should know that it's a it's a wonderful book, and it's also uh, quite a long, detailed, and, and yet sweeping uh, narrative of uh, of uh, this period of history. Islam's story is incredibly complex, of course, but you can, I think, reduce it to um, a very uh, simple uh, and impressive outline. Uh, uh, Muhammad heard his religious calling at the age of 40 in the year 610. By the time he died in 632, uh, you know, he had already spread the faith through conquest uh, throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Within a few decades, his uh, followers had spread the faith uh, as far as the region we now, uh, regions in what we now call China, and uh, uh, as far as North Africa. And in 711, the first Spanish commander arrived on the uh, Iberian Peninsula in Spain. Within three years, Muslims controlled much of the Iberian Peninsula. My question is, is simply, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, uh, set of events, and my question is, how did they do this? Uh, a big part of the known world comes under Muslim sway in a very short period of time. Yes, and <clears throat> I, I didn't set out to try to tackle that uh, explanatorily. I was going to start uh, after this had been achieved, this uh, Muslim ecumen uh, with uh, this uh, remarkable uh, accumulation of real estate. But uh, more and more I thought, no, I, I need at least to satisfy myself that this is not a phenomenon that is just beyond explanation in terms of its uh, uh, scope and, uh, and celerity. And I think the explanation I, I, I give here is that, uh, with all due uh, credit to 
the power of uh, the mobilizing power of, of the, the message the, the message of uh, of Islam uh, and the genius of the early leaders of uh, the faith those Rashidun uh, caliphs uh, the four rightly guided uh, um, assistants of uh, of Muhammad who succeeded him and all of that uh, the fundamental reason was the uh, to be found in the superpower conflict ongoing for nearly 700 years between, uh, we call it Iran today, but it was the Sasanid Empire of Persia and the Roman Empire, both Western and Eastern uh, in its iterations. That conflict began uh, a few years before the Common Era began, about 53 uh, um, uh, BCE, and it ended in 622, roughly, uh, this slugging match, this demolition derby between the Shah and Shahs of Persia and the uh, emperors of uh, both uh, Rome and uh, Constantinople. And exhausted as they were uh, in the uh, second decade of the seventh century, it uh, uh, made possible and uh, created indeed a power vacuum which was filled. Uh, by uh, Islam emerging from the Saudi Peninsula. Um, so that's it. Uh, and, and the fact that these uh, uh, tribes um, <clears throat> welded now uh, together by a, uh, uh, an ideology or a, a faith were remarkably uh, quick learners. Uh, and so they benefited from <clears throat> the military and uh, uh, scientific and uh, bureaucratic um, um, accomplishments of the uh, Persian Empire. Uh, and uh, although uh, they uh, didn't defeat the uh, Eastern Roman Empire then and there, um, uh, but forced it out of uh, much of uh, uh, the Tigris-Euphrates uh, 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 delta, uh, they also learned from Byzantium, or what came to be called Byzantium. And so, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a, uh, an ending war between superpowers uh, and the uh, uh, ingredient of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, religious uh, élan uh, go a long way to explain the phenomenon. It's funny, uh, <clears throat> you've uh, mentioned these several other empires, and there are more in your book, mm -hmm. rising and falling. Uh, and uh, part of your argument or uh, narrative uh, about their fate uh, involves the, the idea of religious toleration. And it, it seems that in uh, uh, both the case of, uh, of uh, Persia and uh, Byzantium, uh, eventually with the Muslims in, in Spain, uh, along with the Christians in Europe, uh, this, this phenomenon of religious toleration, its presence or its absence, uh, winds up playing a very key role uh, in the fate of empires, as I understand it in your, in your book. It, it does. And in fact, to, to carry on with the reason for the remarkable success of, uh, of, um, of, of Islam <clears throat> in the 6th and 7th and 8th centuries, uh, those other empires uh, were not remarkably tolerant mm. uh, of their, of their subpopulations. Sure. Uh, for example, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, we today would uh, would detect a great deal of uh, of uh, institutionalized uh, anti-Semitism uh, in it. Uh, there were uh, Christians who endlessly debated the uh, murky business of the Trinity, uh, and there were those Nestorians who said that uh, the Trinity made no sense, and then there were Monophysites who said uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, and they were persecuted depending on the right. changes in the regime. So that when the Muslims came along with that famous uh, statement in Surah uh, number uh, 22 uh, of religion, there is no compulsion, and actually abided by that, uh, they found people uh, uh, rallying uh, to them. Jews in particular uh, were uh, instrumental in much of the success and the organizational uh, savvy uh, of right. Islam in early days. And by the same token, emperors of declining societies found uh, uh, people whose religious freedom they'd, uh, they'd uh, uh, dismissed uh, suddenly found themselves without friends uh, you know, mm. from time to time. Um, 
it is a remarkable feature in your book about uh, Islam, um, and yet there's so many contradictions in, in the spread of Islam and its uh, success. And, uh, and one of them is this idea of jihad, which you mm -hmm. talk about somewhat in the book. And of course, this is uh, an idea that within Islam itself and uh, without, almost since the beginning, has been debated mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, what is the real meaning of the term and, and how is it to be applied. Um, is it a war of uh, uh, eternal aggression against infidels, or is it an internal uh, religious and spiritual kind of struggle, internal within the self or within the society? Um, you know, debate about that has raged for centuries. Yes. What, uh, what um, lessons uh, about jihad do you draw from your own study of this very long period? Your um, distinction of ish, uh, jihad as being an internal phenomenon, uh, self-discipline and self-growth and purity, uh, uh, but on the other hand also a, a very robust and, uh, uh, and militaristic uh, <clears throat> phenomenon uh, is, is appropriate. Uh, and it depends on the time and the place uh, and the exigencies of the moment. Uh, I think when uh, Muslim scholars say that uh, we in the West have uh, 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 underscored the um, aggressive aspect of jihad, that uh, this is a, uh, a misrepresentation, that it may be there, mm. uh, that is the aggressive aspect, but it's there uh, as a necessity of uh, self-defense. Uh, and of maintenance of, of the culture and, and its ideals, but that the essence of, of jihad is really uh, the growth and development internally uh, of, uh, of members of the community mm. in, a, in a religious and, and, and ethical sense. Um, but it's always true, isn't it, that when people feel threatened, uh, they become less nuanced in uh, their, their explanations of their ideals. Right. And I think we see today that uh, those uh, uh, in, uh, who, who, who fear that jihad is a very negative and dangerous and assertive uh, phenomenon in today's world uh, are, must, must be paid attention to. Not, however, necessarily uh, to the extent that, say, uh, Samuel Huntington in his famous book, Clash of Civilizations, would have it, mm -hmm. where there it was a zero-sum game. It's us versus them. And I think that is uh, a disservice to us as well as a misrepresentation of what jihad really uh, can be about and often has been. Okay. Uh, on more than one occasion, you write about Christian victories almost with a note of regret. Uh, in 731, for instance, you say, you, you talk about a Christian army at the famous... Uh, Battle of Poitiers, which defeated the Muslims, uh, and you say it was uh, the battle that saved Western Christendom, uh, and that's a quote. But you also say that it more or less guaranteed the creation of an economically retarded and balkanized uh, uh, Europe in the future, one that uh, shaped its identity in opposition to Islam and uh, gave itself over to religious persecution. Uh, 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 aristocracy, or rather, hier you know, rigidly hierarchical social order, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, that's a rather controversial assertion. Um, where does it come from? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I stand by it, but I modify it, uh, having watched the recent. Uh, Senate uh, confirmation hearings of a Supreme Court uh, justice nominee uh, who uh, marvelously qualified uh, so many of her statements. I think I, 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 I've learned something, in, not in a dodgy way, but uh, what I meant to suggest, and, and let me be candid, that oftentimes historians who are faithful to uh, the, the canon of objectivity nonetheless have a message that they think really needs pushing, given the times. And uh, this book was written at a time when I feared that uh, the clash of civilization indeed would become uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And I thought if one suggested, uh, uh, emphasized the contingency of history, it would be rather sobering. And so your uh, reference to that battle uh, of Poitiers at the foot of the Pyrenees, um, <clears throat> It was a very close run thing at a time when I think arguably you may uh, 
uh, say that Islam and the Muslim world was three to four centuries ahead of the benighted Germans and others who uh, had inherited the detritus of the Roman Empire. And so had uh, Europe become part of, uh, of the uh, Muslim ecumen, indeed, uh, many of the things that uh, uh, had to happen in order for Europe to become an advanced civilization would have been jump-started uh, much, much sooner. And so that was what I, I meant to suggest. I didn't mean to say, however, and I'm awfully glad uh, that it worked out that way because there is the flip side, and that is that there are things that are unique, perhaps, to the West which have to do with separation of church and state and a sense of individuality, which some of us think is, uh, is a Precisely the, the point I was going to bring up. Uh, one of the uh, main uh, characters in your, your narrative is, of course, Charlemagne, mm -hmm. uh, the man who founded the Holy Roman Empire um, uh, shortly after uh, you know, the crucial events we're talking about. Uh, and uh, who's a fascinating character, uh, who did uh, some extraordinary and some despicable uh, uh, things. But one of the most remarkable things uh, about him, I think, is that he uh, uh, becomes the Holy Roman Emperor uh, and has uh, some religious uh, functions and, in fact, uh, pretty much dictates a number of things as he wishes. But there's still a pope in Rome with whom he much must deal and uh, at various times uh, uh, pay homage to and uh, uh, recognize his separate authority. And there is, even in that rather brutal time, as you describe it, um, a, a separation there between uh, church and state that, uh, <laughs> that you don't really see. Um, no, in quite, those marvelous. Uh, absolutely uh, not, because the idea of that separation is simply uh, in, inconceivable right. uh, in, in Islam, right. um, uh, and and they would say uh, desirably so, uh, indeed. Uh, this is a this is a, a false uh, di right. dichotomy. They, right. they would they would hold. Tell me, um, in 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 Spain, where uh, the uh, Muslims arrive in in 711, within three years they've. Mm -hmm. Uh, taken over most of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and it becomes really a grand age uh, in, in Muslim civilization and probably in world civilization. It's sort of an extraordinary thing, given especially some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, and in particular, uh, in the 10th century, we have the appearance of a figure uh, who's uh, called, known as the Falcon. And I think the figure in your book, who you admire the most. Uh, he presides over a Muslim Spain from Cordoba. Um, and, and, and tell us, why, why, what is it that's so admirable about the falcon, which I love to say? Yes, the, the falcon, uh, Abd al-Rahman I, uh, or al-Dahil, uh, uh, the, the immigrant, as, as he was called, um, what was the, the founder of, uh, of uh, Muslim Spain, or the Umayyad uh, Spain, and he brought with him uh, necessarily a high degree of, uh, of religious tolerance, one, because the faith itself commands that, but secondly, because they were in a distinct minority, the conquerors, and so it would have been uh, strategically ill-advised to have been too harsh and hard on the five million uh, Jews, uh, Galicians, uh, Latin Romans, and others uh, conquered, um, but also because um, this was a civilization uh, arriving on the Iberian Peninsula uh, that was part of uh, the first world trade uh, uh, community, really, from China to Sijil Masa uh, uh, at the foot of the uh, of the Sahara uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, you have commercial activity, uh, which uh, would uh, uh, would uh, would uh, does anticipate in many ways the the uh, the uh, the EU. Um, so <clears throat> uh, Iberia benefits from this 
uh, heightened uh, uh, cultural uh, level, benefits from the demographic uh, necessities of the politics of it all. And he is succeeded by, followed by other Abdal Rahmans. And there at Cordoba, as you say, uh, we have a, a city that, that is the great metropole of uh, uh, the other side of the Mediterranean. Huge, 500,000 perhaps, a library of uh, 300,000 volumes, uh, paved roads and uh, lanterns uh, illumined at night, uh, chess played and hostelries, uh, checks cashed and all that sort of thing. It, I use the term pro, pro, uh, proto-modern because in many ways economically and culturally uh, uh, Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain was. Uh, and the collaboration uh, between the, <coughs> the groups there. Right. Uh, there are many, but the primary ones are the Sephardic group, Jewish, uh, the Christians, uh, the Muslims, and that collaboration, mind you, somewhat condescending on the part of the hierarchically right. advantaged uh, uh, Arabs or Saracens or Moors as they come to be called, right. but nonetheless that collaboration was quite remarkable and merits the term st stretched a bit a pluralistic uh, civilization. Right. Uh, yes, the the outsiders or the or the the Christians and the Jews and the others paid uh, taxes and so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes were required to wear separate kinds of clothing and mm -hmm. so on. But many of those restrictions faded away. Uh, it's an interesting time. Interesting to me that the Arabs, uh, nomadic people, become such great mm -hmm. city builders. Yes. Uh, yes. In this place. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that Umar, the great caliph the real organizer of the faith right. uh, to uh, the second caliph after uh, Muhammad's uh, death, uh, who didn't want his uh, warriors to stay in cities. And so uh, there were or, um, orders that after conquering the city, they were to set up their tents outside. And for example, uh, therefore Carthage, they decided not to keep, right. and it fades away. And a number of cities no longer exist. Right. But Inescapably, uh, the city city culture permeated uh, right. them, and soon they become quintessentially urban. And yet, this golden age in Spain is is actually relatively short lived. I mean, the Muslims are there for uh, quite some time, uh, but things do begin to fall apart. Uh, the, mm. the Europeans are fighting back. Uh, uh, the Vikings are raiding, and, and mm. but that may not be the worst part of it. The worst part of it is that Muslims begin fighting among themselves, and mm -hmm. and you have the return of this uh, religious intolerance, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in this uh, community. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what happened? What went wrong? Well, the convivencia, which uh, is the term that uh, characterizes this interfaith uh, collaboration, that uh, at its best is really uh, admirable. Uh, is uh, increasingly um, opposed by the Reconquista, uh, the, uh, the resurgent uh, Christians, geographically uh, to be found in the uh, far north of, uh, of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, up around the Bay of Biscay and Galicia and Asturias and Leon Castile. They had never been incorporated in the Muslim experiment or in the Muslim uh, um, um, uh, entity on, on the continent. Uh, <clears throat> and as time goes by, uh, they do find themselves uniting. And curiously enough, the unity comes because the Muslims um, uh, overextend themselves. Uh, there is a crisis of the regime and uh, a Napoleonic figure to hold things together goes off and wins victories everywhere. And they are st uh, staggering victories, some 50 uh, right. uh, incursions into the north. And the poor Christian uh, uh, kinglets, of course, are uh, un uh, undone again and again. But finally, they say, look, we've got to collaborate. Right. And they do begin to do so. And that is the beginning then of the advance of those united groups with the support of both uh, economic and, of course, moral and ideological of a recrudescent uh, uh, papacy. We have to cut to our, our last question, and so I want to briefly summarize that uh, around 1296, as I recall, um, uh, uh, the Muslims uh, suffer a great uh, setback, Cordoba Falls, as I recall, and uh, in the next 200 years or so, uh, Muslims are, are, are confined to a small part of the peninsula and finally um, go. 
And in a way, they go also from you know, the Western consciousness. This whole period of history is within a couple of uh, centuries um, uh, uh, reduced to a blur. In the mm -hmm. Arab world, this history seems to be very much alive. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if in just a few seconds you, you, you can tell us why and, and, and what we can learn from this. The, as, as this remarkable <clears throat> uh, civilization uh, uh, crumbles, and I should add just one element, that one of the reasons it crumbles is that to save itself, it brings to its support the Almoravids and the Almohads, and those were fundamentalists from the uh, North African peninsula, the Maghreb, and they were uh, wonderful warriors. However, uh, they were also quite intolerant, and so uh, they tinctured this uh, progressive Islam that we have been talking about mm -hmm. uh, and, and transformed it. As that is happening, though, in Toledo, the old habits uh, persist. Christians, Jews, and Muslims, as scholars, begin to translate and comment on Plato and Aristotle and Euclid and the Hindu numbers and uh, botany and uh, geology. And there is, uh, I use the uh, image of a conveyor belt of knowledge right. from Toledo into Paris and into Florence and indeed into Frankfurt. And those are the seeds of, of course, the European uh, Renaissance. Right. Without that, uh, it would not have happened. And I would just like to emphasize that because quite lately a revisionist historiography is underway. Uh, a French historian has written a book called Aristotle on uh, Mont Saint-Michel in which he says Arabs and Muslims had nothing to do with the rebirth of knowledge. It all came by way of Syriac monks uh, to Mont Saint-Michel. Right. Not so. Right. We must remember that that collaboration and that permeation were indispensable to making us what we are, and we are and remain indebted to them. Well, very good. Thank you very much, Professor Lewis. And that's our program. I'm Steve Lagerfeld, and you've been watching Dialogue. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHZ Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhzworldview.org. Join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching.